He used to put about eight barocas in two litres of water and drink that in an afternoon before the game or the night before the game and then he'd have two sleeping tablets to go to bed. I'd like to give a big shout out to the Hoodoo Gurus who have given us permission to use part of their song That's My Team as our new podcast episode intro for all of their music and whenever they are going live or performing live head to their Facebook and their Instagram the links will be in the description below be sure to give them a like and a follow as well on Facebook and Instagram. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Final Tackle Podcast, and we're joined by 2001 Newcastle Knights Grand Final winner, Daniel Abraham. Thank you very much for joining us, and tell us a bit about what you're doing now, um, post-retirement. Um, so yeah, I guess everything's changed the last few months with the COVID-19 lockdown and everything you know, that had gone on there. Our personal training, uh, as mm-hmm. far as work-wise goes, um, now that took a hit with the uh, oh, COVID nineteen. Yeah, because the gyms would have been shut down and everything like that. Yeah, we were the first to go and the last to open, really. So, <laughs> uh, but it's starting to you know, get busy again now. Um, Footy wise, I was coaching the uh, Knights under sixteen development squad. Okay. Um, yeah, we got across the line as far as regular season, and then the, then the lockdown started. Not you know. All of New South Wales rugby league got cancelled for some time. Yep. Um, is, is it coming back? Is it back? Uh, what's the go there? Community sports is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've got a couple of young boys that play. Um, I'm coaching the Stockton under eights, footy side, helping out with me eldest fellas under 14 squad at Valentine. But, yep. Uh, as far as the uh, New South Wales rugby league you know, development the programs. Club and that sort of stuff is all still down. Yeah, that, that hasn't happened yet, so... Damn. Yeah, it's sort of just a waiting game to see where we go. Honestly, that's fair. It sucks, but, I mean, it's got to be done. Um, Oztag in my local area on the Central Coast just started up again uh, two weeks ago-ish. So, I mean, very lucky to get that going. Um, but, yeah, shit. <laughs> Hopefully that can honestly get back up again for you, um, for the Knights, for in general, because I think it's also Queensland. Um, the Their Intrust Super Cup as well has also stopped um, as far as I'm led to believe in, you know, the QRL and all that sort of stuff. Um, talking about the O1 one Grand Final, obviously probably one of the biggest and best memories of your career, I'm guessing, and definitely the highlight. What was it like to run onto the field on Grand Final Day? Oh, wow. That's, yeah, that's 19 years ago now. <laughs> Makes wow. me feel awfully old. Um, yeah, look, I was... 2001, I was 20 year old. Wow. Um, that was my 15th NRL game. I wasn't actually sure what I was getting myself into <laughs> at that stage. You know, I was you know, I was playing footy. I'd been fortunate. I'd had some great mentors. Um, you know, a couple of injuries went my way, which allowed me to play through the semi final series. Yeah, uh, looking back now, I was you now I was pretty blasé about the whole thing. I was like, wow, is this what it's really like at the top? That mm. yeah. I learned the learned the hard way after that that you know, there's a lot more to it. Um, you know that side that we had fairly phenomenal to run out in front of. Yeah, was it almost eighty thousand people or something like that? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, it was pretty surreal. Yeah, you know, um, you know, at the time I don't think I appreciated it like I should have, but yeah, you know, now definitely looking back, that yeah, you know, I was very grateful for that opportunity to be a part of that. History making squad. No, that's fair enough. Did you follow the Knights growing up, or did you follow a different team when you were growing up? Uh, well, believe it or not, uh, I was uh, a Manly fan growing up. Oh, okay. So '97 wouldn't sit too well as a kid. No, well, yeah. You know, obviously, once I um, in '97, I think I was playing under 16s with the Knights. So obviously, oh, okay. Knight, Knights has always been close to yeah, close to my heart as far as. Um, you know, a team that I support, you know, I don't think it would be fair for me to grow up in a, in a town like Newcastle and not support the Knights, but you know, before they come onto the scene, and you know, as a kid, you know, I was a Michael O'Connor fan, Cliffy Lyons, you know, yep. Beaver Menzies. Um, but yeah, you know, as, I, as I got older and you know, started playing for the Knights, and, you know, I, I soon become you know, very proud and passionate of the club, and, and still am now. You know, I still watch most games and 
you know, like I said earlier, you know, getting involved and helping some of these young kids, you know, 16s from that. And, you know, and I was also an assistant coach of the Jersey Fleet squad, so the under-20s. Under so you know, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, you know, I may not have much to pass on as far as footy knowledge, but what I do have, I'm, I'm happy to pass on. And you know, If it makes a difference to them young guys' game you know, moving forward, helps them create a career, well, you know, I'm all for it. Yeah, honestly, agreed. Um, that's really great to hear. Um, and as you mentioned, you still watch the footy. What are your thoughts on the new rules, you know, like the six again, the captain's challenge, and also how do you think the Knights are going now with the injuries l- lately and how their, their season is sort of, you could say, wrapping up because we're getting towards the business end of the season? Yeah, obviously the injuries are horrible. I, I went through a few fairly significant injuries in my career. And to see blokes, you know, like Connor Watson and McCulloch and them guys go down, you know, Bradman Best at such a young age, you know, go down with some of them injuries is, is obviously really disappointing, you know, to see. But, you know, you know, I have no doubt they'll bounce back you know, bigger and better than players. You know, I think one of the things that we've seen a lot of this year is some fairly um, significant injuries in the game. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I've I've got a level two strength and conditioning um, qualification. You know um, that I've just recently sort of finished, and oh, wow. one of the things that it probably highlights is, you know, probably the lack of preparation that these players have had um, to deal yeah. with the injuries. Yeah, you, you develop resilience towards injuries um, through a preseason. You know, it's not always about being you know bigger, fitter, stronger, faster. Yeah, you know, it's also about developing. Yeah. You know, and some resilience towards injuries, and, and I think we've probably seen what happens when you know, clubs haven't been given the appropriate time to prepare mm-hmm. uh, so as, I, as I read, best I, as they'd like. Yeah, like I read a statistic today that one in five NRL players currently playing are injured, as in out injured. Not, not obviously people go into games carrying injuries. That's a given. Yeah. But I'm, I'm saying currently one in five NRL players are actually out injured, whether that's for a season or whether they're coming back this week. But in general, that's, a, that's in my opinion, an, astro- an astronomically bad statistic. And I cannot think other than COVID for, for that reasoning. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, it probably doesn't come as any surprise. Um, you know, I've watched the games and you, you've only got to look at some of the teams that you know, the likes of Victor Radley, you know, the ACLs and that, that are getting done. Um, yeah. You know, these a lot of these injuries. You know, you can't, you can never, you can never um, protect yourself against a collision injury. Oh, yeah, there's going to be collision injuries in the game as a contact sport. But you know, some of the injuries that are happening, you know, could they have been avoided had the clubs been given, you know, enough time to you know, to get through a structured preseason? There's some you know, phenomenal people behind the scenes of these NRL clubs, with the sports scientists and the strength and conditioning coaches, and you know, all these guys. So. Um, you know, to start and then stop and then go again, you know, it's not the best preparation. How much does it contribute to the injuries? Well, we'll never really know, I suppose. But, um, you know, as far as um, you know, the night's going, they're not going great. But, you know, I think the chopping and changing, you know, the, the um, you know, there's players coming and going with the injury and, you know, all of this stuff. I think it's, um, you know, with a new coach at the club for his first year. He's doing really well with, with what he was, for lack of a better term, given sort of thing. Yeah, look, he's, he's brought some great change into the club. Um, yeah, I listened to a lot of his post-match press conferences and stuff and um, you know, a lot of what he says is very you know, direct but very honest. And um, you know, I think as far as a coach goes, that's all the players can ask for you know, yeah. is, you know, is an honest coach. You know, it's a game played by men, so if you can't handle the honesty or the truth around your performance or you know, moving forward for the club, you're probably in the wrong game. But, you know, um, you know, for him as a coach, I couldn't imagine how difficult it is. You know, I, I, I don't think the Knights have had the same 17 every week I don't you know, with so. injuries coming and going. So, the, you know, the continuity there within the side, you know, so how does that affect his training and his preparation leading into game? So it all contributes to, you know, how the team how the team performs on weekends. So yeah, I think he's doing a great job. But it, it, it's been an uphill battle for him from the start. I think, but yeah, I think he's the right man to be there. 
Well, I mean, I, I personally think he is. He's proven his worth time and time again this season, even with, um, you know, the injuries and a few close but unfortunate losses. But that's still... Um, apples and oranges. He's done so well with the Knights compared to how they went last season and the season before. Um, I, I just, yeah, I can't speak any more highly of Adam O'Brien and what and how he's turned the team and the club, etc., around in such a you could say short time span. Even even pre COVID, they were doing pretty well. Um, now talking a bit about more about your career, you went over to the Cowboys after your time with the Knights. Had a short stint there. What was it like up there in Townsville and the atmosphere change and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, well, the the, the Townsville one sort of it was kind of come as a surprise, I suppose. I I initially went to Mackay to play. For uh, it's, it's a long story, but I yeah uh, I'd fallen out with the Knights and Brian Smith. Um, and then, you know, initially I'd signed a deal to go over to London, play for the London Broncos in the English Super League. Okay. Uh, but that fell through with some Super League, uh, with some um, visa restrictions. Yep. Yeah, having not played enough games off the back of a, coming off the back of a couple of broken legs, or broken ankle and a broken leg. So then, yeah, I um, moved up to play in the Queensland Cup with. Mackay Cutters, which was a feeder club to the Cowboys. Yep. Cowboys were having a wretched run of injuries. Um, and, yeah, I got the call up after, you know, six or eight weeks in the Queensland Cup to go and join the Cowboys for six weeks. But, you know, I was, I was living in Mackay. I was working in Mackay, playing footy there. But then I was, you know, I was, you know, flying up to Townsville or driving up to Townsville, living uh, with one of the teammates for a few days. And, you know, at the time, my wife had, now my son would come up, and then we'd you know we'd have a motel for a few days, and yeah, you know, it was it was yeah you know, probably wasn't ideal circumstances, but yeah, it, it it lasted for probably six weeks, and then I really had to make a decision on my future as far as yeah you know, supporting my family, but playing rugby league, and and you know I took the family option first, and and played part you know, of back to like Mackay cutters sort of stuff. Yeah, I went back to Mackay, and yeah. Um, but then ultimately, it, you know, in 2009, that sort of the relationship, my marriage fell over and then I moved back to Newcastle and you know, played some local league for the last 10 or 11 years. That was uh, Curry Curry, wasn't it? Uh, the Bulldogs and also the Scorpions that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, well, I, you know, a good mate of mine, Luke Quigley, we, we played a lot of footy together at the Knights. Um, he was playing for Curry at the time and we always joked that if I ever come back to the Newcastle comp, uh, he and I playing the same team together, so it was a fairly obvious choice which one I was going to go to. And um, yeah, I, I spent seven seasons, I think, with Curry. Wow! And then made the transition over to Toronto in 2016. And, and yeah, Toronto was. Are you still playing for them these days? No, no, no. Them days are over. <laughs> the body, I struggle to get out of bed these days. Let alone play, let alone play footy. But I, I finished up. I finished up last year. That. Well, you managed yeah. to, to, to have a good to have a good knock well well into your thirties, which some people don't even get the chance to. Some of them hang up the boots at thirty four, some thirty three, and then don't even play you know um, local footy or you know sort of stuff. Which yeah, so big testament to yourself and your fitness there. Um, yeah, appreciate it. Oh, what was I going to say? Um, that's right. Um, how did you handle going from player as in NRL sort of thing? to retirement, more or less? Um, well, mine come about, like I, I had a broken ankle and then I broke, you know, removed that fracture. This was in 2004. I come back from that and in 2005, I broke um, my tibia and fibula in my Ooh. leg. Uh, I had a fairly <laughs> horrible run, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I've had, 10 operations on my lower right leg trying to get stuff you know, sorted out. You know, I had a few complications and plenty, there was plenty of difficulty to overcome and it finished up with a titanium rod going down the middle of my tibia and, it, and it's still there. It's still there today. Um, I don't see any real need to take it out unless the doctors tell me to. Yep. So Do you go my, off my beep, beep through the airport security and stuff? No, no, no. believe it or not. <laughs> titanium doesn't register on that one apparently. Okay. Yeah, okay, that's good. Don't, but don't worry, it's a, it's a common question. Um, but yeah, so my career took a real sharp turn 
And then, you know, I, it, it suited no fault of the Knights that, you know, I was, you know, pushed aside because I, was, I wasn't a positive influence within a, in the playing group. And I, I was a senior player. I played for the Knights since I was 15. I mean, yeah, so you I'd come through had the system. Games under your belt by the time you left the Knights. Yeah, yeah. So I, I um, you know, once that injury hit, you know, the the player welfare and the management, you know, the well-being managers and that that the clubs have now, they weren't around back then. And I was kind of left to fend for myself, and I didn't have the skills or the tools. Um, yeah, so I sort of spiraled out of control, been a negative negative influence, and yeah, on the club and the players, and, and so it was no surprise um, that. that you know, I was pushed out the door at the end of the day when Brian Smith came along and Brian Smith's not going to tolerate you know, what I was offering. Um, yeah, and then to go to the Cowboys, you know, I kind of, you know, to restart of the Cowboys, I would have had to take you know, a match payment contract and I would have had to really gamble it all. Um, you know, I was mid-20s with a wife and a son. Mm. I couldn't live off match payments. Um, you know, Tear a hamstring and miss four weeks. There's no money for four weeks, so exactly, yeah. it's not it's not the sort of circumstance I was willing to put you know, my family in at the time. So I had to make a choice. So um, yeah, and then you know, coming back to the Newcastle comp, you know, I, I've always enjoyed football for what football's got to offer. Uh, you know, whatever level, you know, the sacrifices are still the same. Um, yeah, and sometimes the challenges at a, at a lower level can be more than those at the NRL level because yeah. The boys that run around playing this community football, they've got support families, work jobs. Yep. Yeah. They don't, they're, not, they're not on three quarters of a million dollars. It's, it's literally the lower grades, like the A grade stuff, and even the Canterbury Cup is literally um, more or less what the NRL used to be have a day job, train two or three times a week, and then yeah. play on the weekends. Yeah. And then the expectation of these young athletes is huge. Yeah. So it's awfully tough there. You know, so every level of football's got its own sacrifices and, yeah. You know, its own challenges that everyone's got to overcome. So you know, I learned a lot playing in the local league. Um, yeah, it wasn't until I got a bit older that I you know, started to appreciate how good I had it when I was at the NRL level. But like I said, I was, I was only a kid. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's honestly fair enough. And a very honest and more or less raw answer for that, which is on, I really appreciate that. Um, switching to some fun topics, what's your current beer of choice? Current beer of choice? Yes. yes. Well, unless you're not a beer fan, in, in which case, what's your drink of choice? Oh, look, anybody who played in the era that I played in wouldn't have fit in. They didn't love a beer, so I, yep. I love a beer. Yep. Um, beer of choice, we go to is a great northern. Oh, love um, northern. If I'm going out on a limb and want to spoil myself, I'll get a carton of wild yak. Okay, yeah, wild yak's all right. I've been put it's, onto a nice drop the other, the other day, actually, oh, about four or five days ago, called Bolter. It's like it's, yes, yeah. It's really yeah. I had it. I had it. Um, I had a go at it oh, a month ago. Yeah. Um, used to be owned by a couple of surfers. I can't even think of their names. Yeah, Mick Fanning, I think. Pa- them yep. Yeah. And Parkinson was he one of them too? I think Mick so. Fanning and yeah, yeah. They brewed it and then sold it for a mozza. Yeah, it's so different. Like it tastes, in my opinion. Similar to a cider, but without the fizziness of a cider, if that makes sense. Yeah, very similar to a um, stone and wood. Yeah, yeah, very similar. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm loving that drop, um, as in Bolter, and also can't go past a Great Northern any day of the week. Um, yeah. Like it, like yourself, if I want to treat myself, I'll go a Bolter from now on, but obviously just regular will be about probably a Great Northern or a 4X. Um, yeah, how do you like yeah very steak? similar. Steak? Yeah, how do you like uh, steak cooked? It's got to be medium well, no red, yep. no blood. Not mooing. <laughs> no, no, no movement. I don't, yeah, I like my steak cooked proper. That's um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can't handle the handle the red meat. No, that's fair. Um, yesterday I spoke to Mick Crocker and he likes it blue. Really? Yeah. I don't, know how they, I don't know how they do it. It'll be cold in the middle. Yeah, I can I can deal. Like, I'm a fan of medium rare, but I can't have rare or blue. Like, I call blue still mooing, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I'm on the, um, yeah, I've got to be on the well done side of medium. Yep, yep. So, like, more or less, it's dead, been run over, and then cooked. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay that. with that. I'll add gravy if it's too dry. Yep, yep, fair call. If you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? 
Oh, wow. Well, I always wanted, when I was a kid, every kid wanted to fly. Yep. Yeah, be Superman, yeah. Be, be something like that with flying, yep. Yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah. It'd be convenient now because COVID. <laughs> That'd be perfect, yeah. No, I think I think every kid grew up wanting to fly at some stage or another, and yeah, I don't think I've outgrown that desire. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um, what is your current like? If you're watching a show on Netflix or TV or whatever, what's your current binging show that you're watching? Well, I'm the kind of person that once I start a show, mm. I get really obsessive. It. Now I went through the, I went I went through a few se- few seasons of Queen of the South. Okay. Um. But the current one is Yellowstone with okay. Kevin Costner. I've I've been I've yeah. been seeing ads, but I'm not sure if it's worth it. Do you do you recommend it? Well, I love it. So I I enjoy the countryside. You know, every opportunity I go out west, so friends out of Coonabarabra that own some land, so I go and spend some time there. For me to sit back in my lounge room and watch, you know, these cattle ranches in Montana on millions of acres. Well, that's kind of a dream come true for me. And you know, watching them get around doing everything on horseback and. Yeah, the, the country and the wild and and, and the landscape that they live in. So yeah, I, yeah. But one, I enjoy the storyline, and two, just the scenery and the and you know, in the series is yeah, breathtaking in places. Well, I'll definitely have to check that out. Um, did you have any pre-game routines, whether it's the night before or the day of a game? And if not, who had the weirdest routine? Because I was told the other day by um, Mark Hughes that um, Matty Johns used to lay out about ten pairs of boots. And then he'd pick one pair to play in that, like the following day or that day. First of all, can you verify that? And also, again, who had the weirdest routine if you didn't have one? Um, well, I only, I only played a handful of games with Maddie, so yeah, I, don't, I wasn't exposed to that. But mm-hmm. look, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> um, for myself, pre-game routine? No, I, I never really had one. You know, I, yeah, I, I can't think to be honest. If I had anything in particular, you know, I. Now, I, I played a bit of reserve grade with one of the uh, with James Wynn, and you know, Winnie went on um, to play over in France and World Cups and stuff. Um, yeah, we we used to listen to Thunderstruck on our way to the game. We used to pick him up. It was a little routine that we had, but by no means a pre-game ritual. As far as you know, pre-game routine, so I got never really paid too much attention to what everyone else was up to. It was more about you know what I could do well. Yeah, well, I mean, it, let's be honest. If someone had a really weird one, it would have stood out to you anyway, sort of thing. Yeah, well, I, I I laugh about I, I remember with Ben Kennedy you know, during the semi final series leading to two thousand and one, and he used to have he used to put about eight barocas in two liters of water and then drink that of an afternoon before the game or the night before the game, and then he'd have two sleeping tablets to go to bed. Uh, I couldn't imagine the roller coaster. I couldn't imagine the roller coaster he was going through uh, to try and get to sleep. Uh, we used to laugh. I used to laugh about that often. No, that, that yeah. that's definitely a different routine. Steve Simpson and Matt Parsons were always roomies. So I think, I think on the away games, creating um, habits so that you're comfortable and confident leading. You know, when you're staying in a motel at Parramatta or down at Coogee or wherever it is, yeah. you know, a lot of the guys used to enjoy the same roomie. Yeah. You know, who was your and, roomie that you enjoyed? You know, going on away trips with. Oh, yeah. Me and BK had, like I said, I was only, I was only, yeah. You know, 20 year old um, in the biggest stage of my career um, so to be room room with BK who was you know, probably at the peak of his career yeah you know, it was outstanding we used to have plenty of fun times yeah you know, I can't think now but it'd probably BK you know, we, we used to get along really well share very similar habits um, yeah hobbies yeah. Uh, no that's fair um which team was the toughest to go up against mentally and physically for yourself? Um, oh wow, it's been, it seems so like long ago. That's a problem for me. Yeah, I remember. I remember Brisbane when I first came into grade. Yeah, you know, I remember. Yeah, you know, remember the, the, the game that you know Gordon Tallis got Sim off that elbow and opened him up. And, yeah, Gordon Tallis and Matty Parsons are great mates, but on the field they were yeah. uh, better rivals. Oh, they were ferocious competitors, and they were arguing with each other and calling each other names <laughs> and charging into each other. And, I'm, and then off the here field, I am, they'd be having a beer together. They'd sit together and have a beer and laugh about it when they were living together at St George. You know, so to, to be out there listening to Gordon Tallis, who yeah, you know, when you're 19 coming into first grade or 20 coming into first grade, yeah. You know, 
the, the, the thought of being on the same field as someone like him having watched what he's done through State of Origin Series you know, years yeah. prior, you know, was, was extremely intimidating. Um, yeah, not to mention Wendell Sale, a lot of you carry them guys that were, yeah, they Shane were Webke, seven and seven and seven. They, they were, so pretty they much were tremendous. early 2000s Broncos were the team that would always, not necessarily scare you, but would just, you know, put you off your game a little bit. Oh, well, I think they all put me off my off my game back then. You know, it's all new. It was all new to me. I was like, yeah, um, towards the back end of my career. Yeah, you know, I was trying to think. Yeah, look, like the Roosters were always good. Adrian Morley. Oh, yeah, you know, them guys. Machine. Yeah, they were extremely intimidating. Them guys. Uh, yeah, you knew you had to work for every hit up and every tackle and. Good. Yeah, there probably wasn't one that stood out more than any other. So, like I said, you know, at that level, every team, and I think you know, the current game's proven, and now you, you've only got to be off 5% you know, and the opposition will win. Yep, and you'll, you'll pay for it. Yeah, no, I get you. Um, we've got a question from one of our podcast sponsors, Sky Spark Electrical. They ask... What advice would you give your teenage self with what you know now to go through life oh, wow. and through the NRL? Um, to go through the life, uh, to go through the NRL. Um, and, and I think the NRL can capture it really well now with the wellbeing stuff they do. Like I've done a bit of the wellbeing training and all that sort of stuff. Um, they, they really cover that, you know, with gratitude. Um, to, you know, which, which I think is a big thing, you know, being coachable. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't that when I was younger. I think I was the rat bag. You know, I was the, I was the, you know, I, I already knew it kind of thing. You know, I think. But you can't tell me um, anything new, sort of thing. Yeah, to a degree. Um, but I think that's a lot of teenagers. Yeah. Also, <laughs> um, I've got a teenage <laughs> son. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Moving forward from a, you know, from a teenager through to, you know, I, I think it's just. Just be coachable. Mm-hmm. Just soak it all up. You know, learn as much as you can. You know, be patient. You know, I, I had this conversation with some of the 16-year-olds that I coached this year. You know, the under-16s development squad, it wasn't the end game. You know, be coachable. Let yourself grow. You know, work on every aspect of your game, the skill aspect, the athletic development. And especially in today's game, some of these guys are giants. Mm. Yeah, and they, they're twice as big as I was, and they moved like the wingers did when we were playing. When I was back when I was playing, you know, it's enormous. You know, and as far as going through life, yeah, you know, like I said, gratitude's at the top of my list. You know, and I learned that late. I learned that really late. Um, but yeah, you know, life, and yeah, you know, and I think this is a bit of um, the well-being stuff that I've done. Yeah, a little bit of study that I've done with the well-being. It's yep. don't focus. On, I was guilty of it, and a lot of players were back then. You focus all your time and effort into your rugby league career, and you become um, recognised by others, and you recognise yourself as Daniel Abraham, the rugby league player. Yeah. Um, whereas there's so much more to yeah, the rugby league life than, than, than rugby league. Yeah, than rugby league. You know, but also you've also got to be Daniel Abraham, the husband, or the Daniel Abraham, the brother, or the son, or the nephew, you know, the next you, neighbor, the father, the son yeah, of the Holy Spirit. So, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you put all your eggs in the one basket, and I found out this the hard way, you put all your eggs in the one basket, and then all of a sudden you, you know, two or three fractured lower leg injuries. Um, all of a sudden that balloon's popped, and you're relying on all those other little balloons in the room. That yeah, you know, if you get a, if you get a, if you get a room and fill it up with three or four or five balloons, if you pump one of them up to take up all the space, well, if that balloon pops, there's a lot of empty space there. So, you know, I think, you know, focus on your rugby league career by all means um, because it's worth chasing. Hmm. But don't neglect every other avenue. For example, work. Have a, have a plan B. Have a backup plan, yeah. So, rugby league doesn't um, last forever. Not these days, unless you're Cameron Smith or one of these <laughs> you know, phenomenal athletes that, I think the, I think the average NRL career is around fifty games. Yeah, but um, yeah, from what I've been told now, I, the other week I read a statistic. It was like the average NRL career, yeah, is about three to five years ish in length. And yeah. that's and that's 
a good career, like like winning yeah. grand finals career. Not obviously, Cam Smith is a total different breed. He's a very similar He's... breed to player of, of viewer in the sense of from that age in sort of thing, but they're few and far between now. I think he's one of the last remaining ones. Like the other ones before them would have been probably Cooper, Kronk, Billy Slater, JT. Yeah. And then before them was retiring, you know, such as, um, yeah, it's just, it's crazy. And if you take, if you take them guys, yeah, played their 300 and obviously 400 for Cam Smith. And yeah, if you take their, yeah, they're, they're a freak of nature mm -hmm. as far as the rugby league players go. You they're take them out. Work, they're also talent at the same time. Yeah, yeah, they've got every aspect. You know, um, you take them out of the equation, and the, and the average number would plummet. Yeah, the, the, you know, the, 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 the average the average number of games for an NRL athlete would plummet. So, you know, there's obviously got to be a plan B. And like I said, the NRLs really captured that um, with a lot of the well-being stuff they do now. I think they do a fantastic job. Yeah, um, you know, ensuring that you know, guys like me, at 25 year old, don't. You see the NRL career coming to an end and not have a qualification or a career to fall back on. So you know, I think that's definitely important. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, and I mean, this you kind of covered that in the last question, but last topic I've got is, do you have any advice for youngsters that are wanting to make it in the big league one day? Just keep trying. Just keep trying. I, I, I help out with a couple of different teams in the area. You know, I help out with the 14-year-olds. Um, footy side I went there last night and helped out with some defensive stuff and you know I know as a coach I gravitate towards the kids who want to listen and learn and I think you'll be that forever bashing your head against the time. yeah that are coachable you know, you know and they're the ones that people will give their okay. time I'm doing it for nothing so if you're going to if you're going to devote your time um, for free you're going to do it for the kids that are coachable. You know, they're going to want to listen and learn and uh, you know, appreciate so get something out of it. And so then you also get something out of it by seeing yeah. them grow from what you've been teaching them. Yeah, that's it. You know, and just you know, be patient. Like I said, be patient because, yeah, you know, sometimes, you know, and I, I, I done my level two coaching a little while ago with Marco Murley and he said it. He said, you know, they're, they're, they're proven that you know, those who get there first generally finish last. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, you know, the kids that have got to work, you know, their backside off for their opportunities. You know, when their opportunities pop up, they generally take them where you know, those that get them hand, you know, gifted to them, you know, don't appreciate like they yep. should. Yep. Um, well, the old adage, you know, hard work, hard work works. Sorry. Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work. Yes. 100%. You know, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I've played alongside some blokes that, you know, I use Clint Newton, for example. He and I played plenty of junior football together and, you know, I, I laugh and tell him all the time, I said, you, you were the worst junior football I ever played with. But he went on to play 200 NRL games, yep. had a hell of a career, and look at him now. You know, he's, he's, he's one of the uh, you know, main figures in the NRL, you know, leading the way on the in player the association and everything like that. Yes, you know, so he's a perfect example. Kirk Higgs is another one. You know, they just worked and worked and worked. They couldn't make the teams, and all of a sudden they come on the scene because you know, their hard work paid off. Yep, and it, yeah, really did pay dividends for them. Um, that's really about it that I've got listed to talk about. So, first of all, thank you very much for joining me and joining the no, podcast. No, thank you. And I'll get you on at the end of the season to talk about how the Knights did and more or less like a 2020 Knights re pre review of their season. Is that all right? Yeah, mate, sounds great. I'll have to keep watching the game so I have a fair idea of what's happened.